guys, appreciate all of you being here again tonight. Uh, we have uh, a little bit different stuff we're doing today. We'll close here. I know most of you have at some of these that we've done before, but um, what we have at Bow, by the way, has been our strength and conditioning coach, Bo Mr. Cross, since she won our team four years ago. Huge, huge part of our program. Uh, and a huge part of developing lacrosse athletes, uh, the strength and conditioning, the speed training, all of those things that we do. Um, you know, one of the questions seconds with a sip of coffee. Uh, again, thanks thanks a ton for you guys coming out. Hopefully we can give you some ideas that you can take back with you and be able to utilize in your programs and surrounding programs. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, the big question was, <clears throat> you know, where do we start with introduction of strength and conditioning programs or how do we do that with adolescent and youth athletes? And this is a common question across the spectrum of, of competition for people across volleyball, basketball, football, baseball, um, especially in the United States. As we uh, formalized uh, strength training programs for, for youth, are few and far between unless you get into a private club uh, or a private uh, strength and conditioning facility or something along those lines. So I do have uh, 18 slides, which Coach asked me to stay within 30 minutes, so I'm going to cut through a lot of those slides. But the big thing that I want you guys to take with, away from it is that um, um, there's a concept out there right now amongst the, the, in, in the field of strength and conditioning known as long-term athletic development. And the National Strength and Conditioning Association actually has a number of papers and position statements on long-term athletic development. Um, there's one in particular that I want to point out. I'll come back to these slides. Um, it's a practical application of long-term athletic development by a guy named Larry Metters. Larry Metters is about a 50-year strength and conditioning coach. He's a high school educator, high school athletics coach. He's coached track and field in a number of different sports. Um, he's put a lot of time and effort into accumulating a lot of uh, research and information on uh, athletic development in, in youth, both male and fe female. I put a link on there so you can go and you can pull that up. That's a great resource, mainly because it's, uh, there's a lot of research out there on the topic, and some of it gets a little bit um, extensive in terms of the terminology. You've got to have a, a PhD in exercise physiology to understand half of it. He does a really good job of breaking it down into layman's terms and making it a little bit more practical for high school and junior high coaches to understand and implement into their programs. So, just something to go back to. A lot of the information I have in these slides came directly from Larry's research and a lot of his, his input on the topic. So backing up here, where do we start? Long-term athletic development, talent, talent development. Uh, there's a lot of opinions and a lot of research on it, but you're looking at anywhere from eight to 14 years specialized in a particular skill to become elite. Um, now there's a range there because you have talent acquisition. You have some kids with a God-given talent for a particular skill, and then other skill that's actually developed. But you're looking at anywhere 18 to 14 years. So if the kid starts when he's eight, by the time he's 16 to 18 years old, you can probably see some pretty refined skill, some things he doesn't have to quite focus on to be able to just make happen. <clears throat> so that's the time frame you're looking at. <clears throat> Another big part of talent development is your strength and your conditioning development and programming throughout that chunk. Your stronger athlete, your, fit, your athlete that's more fit, is going to be able to reproduce consistent and accurate skills throughout that developmental time period. Your weaker athlete is going to be a little bit tougher for them to repeat those efforts. They're going to fall under fatigue a little bit faster. So your stronger, fitter athlete is going to be able to re reproduce the skill that you're looking for with fine more often. So that's why there's an important an importance on you want your kids to be more fit. You want your kids to be 
to be stronger. There are a lot of other side effects from being strong and fit, like staying healthy and just flat out outrunning the other team or running over the other team. That's always fun to see. But ultimately, we want them to be able to reproduce effective skills. Another big part of where do we start? Coaches' education. So I've, I've, I've coached on the, in the NAIA level. I've done a little bit in high school uh, in strength and conditioning. And usually how it happens is um, we got to get somebody in the weight room. Oh, there, Jimmy. Jimmy, you're going to go and you're going to work with the kids in the weight room. When we get done with practice or when we get done with PE, you're going to go and you're going to take those kids and you're going to put them through a strength program. Whoever that person is, however they get selected or identified, that's going to handle those responsibilities for your program, just make sure, just like if they were going to undertake um, you know, being an offensive coordinator or a defensive coordinator, make sure they understand uh, the, uh, the responsibility there. What, what are we trying to gain from it? What do I need to know? What, there's, a, there's a heavy liability when it comes to strength training or conditioning athletes far beyond what we normally think we're undertaking. Um, but you want to make sure that there's some, a certain level of coaching education there. Provide them with some resources. Let them be able to get, a, get their hands on some books. Let them, to be able, let them be able to get out and get in front of some clinics and things like this so that they can be prepared and provide your athlete with suitable means to strength train and to condition so that they're developing appropriately. Fundamental movement skills is a big part. Everyone wants to get fancy right off the get-go. They see... Uh, you know, a, a player online doing a skill that looks really fun and looks really advanced and they want to get, you know, as a the second year player that's 10 years old to try to replicate that with the same speed, same velocity. Um, and for one, <clears throat> it's a little overzealous, but for two, there are a lot of other very fundamental things that kids should be learning in order to play safe and to play accurate and to play fast and to be able to repeat those efforts over and over again. And then the last thing we're going to hit on is formulating a plan. That's the toughest thing. I think that's the biggest thing I get in terms of questions from coaches is, okay, I got all this stuff, good details, coach. That's a great drill. Thanks for that drill. How do I put it together and make a plan out of it? We realize that coaches, whether it be at the junior high level or up in Division I, they have a lot of other responsibilities and things to take care of, let alone sit down for a couple of hours a day and design a program for these guys for, for strength and conditioning. So with that, long-term athletic development model, if you refer to the, to the link that I uh, provided you later on, you don't, you don't have to pull out laptops now, but if you'll take a look at that, you'll get a clear understanding of what they're talking about. And they cover a broad spectrum of sports, not just lacrosse. So um, it really applies to just about anything. Not only skill development for sport, but also strength and strength, power, speed, and agility development as, as well. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so basically, if you look at that study, if you look at that article, one, one of the key features that I think that Larry throws in there is the sequential formula for athletic development. He basically breaks it down into some very uh, simple stages, from fundamental movement, which is basically jogging, skipping, your most fundamental things that a child should be able to learn how to do, although every year we get kids that come in, and I ask him to skip, and the kid doesn't know how to skip. Or I ask him to skip backwards, and he starts tripping over himself. Or I ask him to shuffle sideways, and he starts tripping over himself. So very fundamental movements. Then you get into more dynamic movements. Um, some of your fancier footwork with dodges and jukes and things to be able to move around, still balanced and controlled, accelerate and decelerate rapidly on demand with, with good balance and control. That gets more into your dynamic movement, your plyometric movement. And then on further down the spectrum is actually development of speed, strength, and ultimately power. Your most powerful athletes, they're the most recognizable. They're the ones that can execute high level skills the fastest and they can repeat those efforts more often than their competitors. So this is kind of the spectrum that you're looking at in terms of where to start with a young kid. I'm not sure if he should be lifting weights or I'm not sure if we should be running that long and that hard. Start with basic dynamic movement first move forward once they get a handle on that into some more strength and eventually some power development. <clears throat> One thing with, um, with developing or where to start with the strength and conditioning program is look at the talent development as well. What does practice consist of? How simple are our practices? Are we working on heavily on fundamentals or do I have a more advanced program, a more advanced team? Well, we're getting some more advanced skills. That can help you determine on where to start with your strength program or your conditioning program. Um, if you've got a pretty low level talent, 
group of athletes, it may be, it may be beneficial for you to revamp your program a little bit and start out a little simpler. So what does practice consist of? How long is practice? Where can I fit supplemental training in? Does it seem more appropriate when you look at the broad spectrum to fit your stuff in if you're gonna lift weights or if you're gonna condition pre-practice, post-practice? A lot of times with agility training and some of the endurance training, it is, it's even more appropriate to fit it in within practice, within those minutes. <clears throat> so that you don't spread your athletes too thin by doing three or four different sessions within a day. So just some, some points to think about. Um, coaches education. So some things to think about with the coaching education piece is personnel. Identify who that person is going to be or a group of, of, of individuals. Who are they going to be that are going to undertake the responsibilities of the strength and conditioning program within your staff? Qualifications, liability. You don't need to go out and get a whole bunch of certifications, but what you do need to be able to get a hold of is some literature, which is pretty easy these days with the internet. You can pretty much Google anything and find tons of literature. Speed development. Throw it in there. You'll get a ton of articles in there. There really is no right or wrong information out there. The more experienced you become and you start digging through that information, is you're going to figure out some of it's a little more applicable for your group of athletes than maybe some of, some of the other things that you read. So it's a matter of just sifting through information. The liability piece is important. If in the case somebody does happen to get banged up doing your program and they get hurt doing your program, you've got to be able to show why you were doing it, how you were instructing it, where you got that information from, does it make sense, does it hold any water. Um, plus, you want to be able to continue implementing that program once that little event has passed on. Uh, you don't want this to put a halt in your program. Uh, bumps and bruises do happen, so you just want to be able to protect yourself. A mission, you gotta have a, a mission with your training. What are we trying to get out of this? What are our goals, short term and long term? We reset our training goals every year. Sometimes in our staff meetings, we're resetting goals weekly, depending on the individual or depending on the position group or depending on the classification of the athlete. Assessment. How are you determining whether or not your program's working? Are you measuring things? How frequently are you measuring things? Do you have standards or deadlines? You have to be able to do A by this point and B by this point. Um, those are some things you want to think about because they'll, they'll keep the validity in your program. Uh, they'll help keep your athletes accountable for it. One big thing that uh, you'll take away from Larry Metter's paper as well as something that I strongly believe in is avoid early specialization. Um, what that means is if you identify a four-year-old and say he's going to be a lacrosse player, that's it. He's not going to try anything else. Um, that, that's what I mean by early specialization, and it happens from time to time. The problem with early specialization is you end up avoiding a lot of other fundamental movement skills that they could be picking up through other athletic uh, events. For example, gymnastics, swimming, baseball. Um, these are, you can pick up skills from each of those that could contribute to a performance on a lacrosse field. Um, so specialization uh, in terms of what should they be spending the majority of their time on um, happens post-pubescent, most of the time around sophomore, junior year of high school. They can still be a multi-sport athlete up until that point, even if they're highly talented in, say, a sport like lacrosse and you know they're going to pursue that, they can gain some benefits from participating in some of these other athletic events. Um, avoid early specialization. Emphasize basic movement and skill development, which we're going to talk about more in just a second. Um, so first, first area, fundamental movement skills. What's Bo talking about when he says fundamental movement skills? The first, there's tiers of it. And the first tier is balance and stability. I don't necessarily mean balance and stability as in this, standing on one foot, because it doesn't really pertain to a player dodging around on the field and avoiding contact and being able to execute a shot. Balance and stability meaning when he gets into the position that his coach is asking him to get into, can he do it fast? Can he do it balanced? And when he's in that position, can he change directions or redirect in any direction that he may need to once he's in that position? So you as a coach, that's where you get to use your eyeballs and, and kind of use your your God-given physics ability to understand, okay, that's a good position for him. Or maybe that's not a good position for him. You need him lower, you need his stance wider, you need his, bo his body weight more centered over his feet. Um, those are things you can identify both in practice and through training. But balance, the ability to stop and land is really critical. If you look at, say, a six or seven year old that's picking up skills with a stick, he's learning how to <clears throat> He's learning how to use a stick and learning how to track the ball, hand-eye coordination. At the same time, he may not be a very good decelerator. He may not be very good at running up and then stopping all of a sudden, balanced and under control. 
<clears throat> he may not be strong enough to be able to stop and land and someone's blowing by him to open his hips up and then track that guy down to get in a good defensive position again. To be able to twist and spin. Um, these are, I mean, these are critical for all kinds of different sports, but uh, we take them for granted a lot because most of the time when kids are little, they learn how to do that by throwing a ball. Well, if you don't throw that ball, then you never pick that up. So then later on, when you try to rotate to swing a stick or you try to rotate to swing a golf club, it's not there. You, you kind of have to practice it at some point. To dodge and to fall, reacting if I need to move out of the way, or if I fall down, how to quickly get back up on my feet and control in a balanced state so that I can redirect and continue to play. In athletic positions, that just goes back to, where does my coach want me? Does he want me in a three-point stance? Does he want me standing up? Does he want me sumo? Does he, you know, what is my body supposed to look like? And that's something that as coaches, we have to constantly, even when they're 19, 20, 22 years old, we still have to reinforce those. Moving a little more advanced, our basic dynamic movement skills, running, forwards, backwards, in angles. Think of this in terms of your youth, your youth kids. On demand, they may not be able to run at an angle. You'll say, run this way, they'll square their shoulders up and run directly that way. Or if you tell them, I want your shoulders to face this way, but I want you to run that way, it's a little weird to them. Those are things you have to develop. So for example, if you got your 16-year-old player in high school who's having trouble opening up his hips and changing his angle, he could just have trouble with a really fundamental running mechanic of running on an angle. So you can go back and get into these really simple skills of running forward, running backwards, running in angles to address some of that. And you can identify who your stronger runners are and, and who's not. Skipping, forwards and backwards, this happens all the time. Division one lacrosse, all right, Johnny, come in, I wanna see you skip, and you can't do it. Um, it's a basic coordinated effort, and it translates into a ton of other speed-specific drills that we need to be able to do later on. Shuffling and sliding. Being able to shuffle your feet and keep distance, keep width, meaning if I slide, if I'm defending this way and I slide and move, I want to keep a certain amount of distance and space between my feet. If my feet come together, I'm momentarily stuck. So if the person I'm defending takes off the other direction, I have to create space in my feet first and then I have to move. Whereas if my base was spread out to begin with and I'm moving, I can open up and move immediately on reaction. So these are things that you can practice just in a basic skill development of a, of a youth, of a child, sliding and, and shuffling. Hopping, jumping, both single leg and double leg. This is getting a little bit more into advanced athletics. It always looks cool when someone flies through the air or someone does a spin, leaves off of one foot. Um, it, those are always cool things to watch, but they're few and far between because a lot of those kids aren't learning those fundamentals when they're, when they're young, very young. And then the last area is object control. So kicking, rolling, throwing, or striking an object or catching, stopping, or trapping an object, and then dribbling. Dribbling with your hands, dribbling something with your feet, and of course, cradling something with a stick. So these get into more advanced skills. So when I break these skills into these categories, I don't mean that Jimmy and Johnny can't practice catching, stopping, and trapping until they're 16, 17 years old. Just that the predominance of their training when they're, say, six, seven, eight years old should be more of those basic movement skills, and then you sprinkle in a little bit of this. As they move further down, uh, the categories and they start getting 16, 17, 18 years old, obviously they need to have that stick in their hand more often as they're getting more playing time. They're, uh, they're playing in more leagues, they're playing more frequently, and now they're spending more of the 52 week year actually playing lacrosse. So sure, that by that point, they need to have that stick in their hand more often. So you go from simple as they're younger, simple, basic, fundamental, physical movement skills to very, what we call advanced, but specialized sports skills as they get older. Um, just want you to have an understanding of the spectrum of that. So intro, intro and resistance training. So this would be really simple if I just walked in and said, all right, coach, here you go. Here's resistance. This is your strength program for your, your team. Go get them. That would be really easy. And I wish it was like that because we get calls all the time and say, coach, I really like what you're doing. I, your kids look good. Uh, we want our team to, to emulate that. Can, can I have your program? And in all honesty, our program is developed to fit our system, to fit our scheme here. Uh, we have 50 athletes. Uh, amongst the 50, I have about seven different programs going on within the group of 50 at any given time. So if I'm lucky, it'll be fewer than that. But um, what that means is I may have a group of kids, group of athletes on one particular program for a set of circumstances. And at the same time, another group of six or seven athletes would be on an entirely different program due to a set of circumstances. 
So what I want <clears throat> to be able to give you is some information where you can go and jot down a few things and construct some very simple ideas so that you have something you can implement with your own group if you feel that that's a, a, of importance to you. So develop fundamental movement skills first. What are you guys good at? What are they not good at? That's how you come up with fundamental movement skills. If you've got a team full of a bunch of great runners, you may not have to do all that much running. If you've got a team that's not very fit and you don't have very many good runners on there, you may have to beef up your running regimen and what you're doing in that area. Um, <clears throat> developmental movement skills and resistance training follow a similar developmental pattern as we would with, with lacrosse training or conditioning or anything else. You start out with basic skills, lunging, squatting, pressing, pulling, things that can be done body, with just your body weight. Then we get into introducing a resistance apparatus, whether it be a piece of PVC pipe or a stick or a, a medicine ball uh, or a barbell. And then eventually we get into long-term progressive overload. Progressive overload, which I'm going to get into more here in just a minute, basically the idea with progressive overload, you don't really want to start progressive overloading until they're post-pubescent. Can it be done sooner? Absolutely, in some very, um, in some very appropriate cases. Uh, but I wouldn't really wouldn't tamper around with that too much. Um, if you wait, there's no question you can do a lot of things to prepare them up to that point, and then when they're at that that time period in their life, when they're getting through that pubescent cycle, then you start to progressively overload them. The skill set's already there, so they have they know how to move, they know how to execute things. Now we're slowly going to implement intensity week to week, day to day, year to year, and you'll see them blossom pretty quickly. Um, so fundamental resistance training skills, push-ups, pull-ups, there's a hundred different variations of them. Um, I don't say, I don't think you need to be limited to what variations you use with, with young kids, um, just that they know how to execute them correctly. So people always ask me, well, what if a kid can't do a push-up? Well, then just sit them in a push-up position and have them hold that position for an extended period of time. Then eventually turn that into a slow three count down to the floor, or maybe a five count down to the floor. Once he can do the both of those, backwards and forwards over and over and over again, then maybe he's ready to try a full push up. Another idea is to take pillows, you can throw them underneath his chest and have him do a limited range of motion until he gets better and moves on down. Especially when we're talking female athletes, a lot of times with the upper body work, they need a little bit more development. Um, we'll learn how to do those skills, but you can get pretty creative. Learn how to do a push-up, learn how to do a pull-up. If a kid can't do a push-up, I don't really need to put him on a bench press yet. It doesn't do me much good. I need him to be able to handle his own body weight, which is gonna be pushing off the ground if he ever falls down. Lunging, squatting, a basic lunge. <clears throat> a couple of different things it tells me. For one, is he strong enough to be able to keep his posture upright and to be able to stand, start, come back right where, he, where, right where he started from. But the other thing it tells me a little bit about is what's his balance like? Is he twisting, is he leaning, is he falling over? He's having a hard time being stable in that area, um, which can tell me a lot about what I'm going to do on the field with him in terms of balance and stability training. Rotation. What's he look? Does he look smooth? Does he look awkward when he rotates? Is he very single plane, or can he turn in different directions and rotate from high to low, low to high? Can he rotate reverse and go back this way the same with the same velocity that he can going forwards? Take a look at him when they're doing things and they're throwing med balls. See if he's doing it all with his arms or is he actually using his hips and his torso when he's throwing things. Um, take a look at his shot. Is he coming back? Is he able to rotate back far enough to get the velocity that he wants at the angles that he wants? Landing. The biggest thing with landing, this gets preached a lot. You've got to teach proper landing mechanics. The biggest thing with landing mechanics, <clears throat> yes, it can save a lot of knee injuries. Uh, it can save you a lot of aches and a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of ibuprofen. It can save you a lot of ibuprofen. The biggest thing with landing that you need to look at is, are they lined up? So if I land with my feet this wide, basically all you're looking for is that my knee is lined up with my foot. If I land with my feet this wide, my knee's over my foot. If I land with my feet here, are my knees over my foot? So the only thing you want to avoid is if I land here, and then we call this valgus knees. You just don't want the knees to come in. So as long as you can execute that, you've taught landing. Um, <clears throat> when kids are landing, the biggest thing about it that's going to translate into later on is how fast they can re-accelerate. So you got a kid that can sprint around, oh, someone's coming, i got to go back the other way. They need to be able to squat themselves down, turn, and accelerate back the other way. So those landing mechanics in the early days will teach him to be able to slow down faster in a good low position, turn around, and get back the other direction 
as quick as he can. So while you may not think that you know a lacrosse guy doesn't really need to get up vertically all that much and then land nice and solid, it's going to translate into other skills later on down the road when he's cutting and decelerating, reaccelerating. Pushing and pulling is just basic pulling, pushing horizontally, or even pulling vertically, or pulling vertically on the way down, <coughs> pushing vertically, um, and then explosive lifting. Explosive lifting gets into weightlifting, Olympic style weightlifting, um, snatching, clam jerking, things like that. That gets on down the more advanced road of, uh, of training. In terms of being able to do all the things on these lists, an eight-year-old can do all of them, a six-year-old can do all of them, a 20-year-old can do all of them. The critical piece is how you progressively overload them, and that's the important part that I want you to take away in terms of when to do that. And again, I can't reiterate enough, it, the safest bet is once they've getting, gotten past that, that, um, that puberty point, um, you're pretty safe to go. Um, the other thing is mindset. You gotta think about mindset a little bit. If you have a kid that's genuinely invested in putting his time into that area of training, because if he's not, it's not always a great idea to force feed it to him. You'd be better off, if he's passionate about lacrosse, you'd be better off giving him some ideas on what to do on the field to stick in his hand, and then you can play a little crossover. Create skills for him, say you want him to work on, his agility training or his, or his acceleration training, put the stick in his hand and get his mind focused on lacrosse if that's the thing he loves and take it away from the thing he doesn't love, which is maybe running around cones with you 20 minutes after practice. <clears throat> so you can tailor it to how you want. So fundamental resistance training. This is just a couple little pointers, again, some things to keep in mind. Start with body weight only, then you can move into a light object, medicine ball, PVC pipe, a light barbell. Uh, light dumbbells, something that they can move easily that doesn't deteriorate their technique, and then into a resistance implement, and then eventually progressively overloading that implement as they get stronger. <clears throat> Planning parameters. Whew, getting close. So, big thing about planning, and you know, I, I've had coaches like, man, coach, I just don't have time to sit down and devise a plan. You don't have to put out a big spreadsheet. It doesn't have to be on Excel. It can be handwritten. It can be on a chalkboard. But basically, you've got to understand a few things. And, you, and whoever you're working with, with your team, should understand a few things. What season is it? Are we in the preseason? Are we in the middle of our season? Are we in the postseason? Uh, are we in the beginning of our offseason? Where are we in the year? How frequent are we, going to, are we going to be practicing? How frequent are we going to be weightlifting? How frequent are we going to be conditioning? Those are important. It should be based on your needs. If we're a relatively strong team, we may not need to weight lift all that frequently. If we're a relatively fit team, we may not need to run all that frequently. If we're a relatively fit team, but we can't execute our clear, then we may need to spend more time on the clear and less time on, on the running. Um, <clears throat> how long are these sessions going to be? Everybody's got their own parameters, whether it's governed by your school, by your, by your club. Um, by your wife telling you to hurry up and get home because you don't need to stay there for four hours that particular day. Whatever the case is, how long is the duration going to be? Number of exercises, number of sets, number of reps. Our coaching staff does a great job with our practice plan. Every day when I get a practice plan, it tells me specifically what segments we're in, how many minutes we're in those segments, and it gives me an idea of the intensity of those segments, if they're contact or non-contact. So then I have a better understanding of what kind of fatigue we're going to endure. I have a better understanding of how long that practice is going to be. Coach Paul's pretty good. If he's better than I am with staying on time, because usually if he says practice is going to be an hour and 35 minutes, it's usually an hour and 35 minutes. I'm working on about 31 minutes right now, Coach, I think. Maybe 31. So the other big key to this is resistance tracking. <clears throat> Keeping a diary. When I start with young kids, it's really easy to get them in a habit. You have a workout, so you got a little something written up, you give it to them. Just tell them to write down what they do. All right, coach, for my push-ups today, I could only get, you wanted me to do 20, but I could only get three at a time. So I did a bunch of sets of three and then a couple of sets of one until I got to 20. Just have them jot that stuff down. That way, months later, you can go back, or weeks later, you can go back and you can look at that stuff, and you can get an idea. First off, is Jimmy being diligent? Second off, is Jimmy making progress? Does my program work? Um, it's important to keep track. You're going to have some kids that get really devoted to this, and some coaches that get really devoted to this, and then some that don't. The more that you can keep track of it, the more you can cultivate and you can design and, and change and tweak your program as the months and years go by. Um, 
I can tell you in the fourth year of this program, uh, if I gave our strength program we have right now to team one, we'd be hurt. We'd be in trouble. There's, there's been a lot of development that's gone on in these four years. So this is a basic set around. This is nothing to, 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 to live and die by. I get a lot of coaches that ask me, okay, I have no idea how many reps to do. I don't have any idea how many exercises to select. I, and I don't know how many, rep, how many reps and sets to do. So this is just a basic idea of what a progressive four-month program could look like. Three to five exercises, two to four sets of 10 to 20 reps a piece. Starting out in the beginning, you want to do lots of repetitions. They can be very light repetitions. <clears throat> you want to do lots of repetitions so one, they have a chance to learn skills. And then for two, you're addressing a little bit of work capacity. You're improving their endurance just a little bit. Month two, four to six exercises, three to five sets of eight to 15 reps. It starts to drop a little bit. The kids can start to increase in speed, increase in intensity. And then as it moves on down, month four, you see three to six exercises possibly. Four to six sets of three to five repetitions. This is where you're really starting to ramp intensities up. So the amount of what you're doing starts to drop a little bit. It's gotta have an inverse relationship. If you're gonna do a ton of stuff, it needs to be relatively low intensity. If you're gonna do a little bit of stuff, you can afford to jack the intensity up through the roof. Um, so as long as you have an understanding of where you are with that. All right, conditioning planning. Again, what season is it? How frequently are we conditioning? How long? Number of drills? Are we measuring miles, yardage? How are we taking a look at how much we're doing? <clears throat> position specific. Am I conditioning position specific? Does my goalkeeper need to run as much as my D-Medi does? Um, do I have a true FOGO or do I have a FOGO that plays a lot of offensive minutes? You can, you can define and understand that based on your, own, on your own team and decide who needs to run what. High minute player versus a low minute player. If you got a high minute player that gets a ton of repetitions in practice, you may not need the same conditioning volume that the low minute player needs when it comes time to condition. But you bet that these guys are going to be expecting <clears throat> if our number one goes down and number two steps in, you better be fit enough to do number one's job. That's kind of what we have to get them ready for. So you got to kind of balance that too and be able to take a look, know your personnel so you can prescribe appropriately. Really quick, this gets kind of scientific, but aerobic and anaerobic. The predominance of lacrosse is played <clears throat> through fast glycolysis, which is that second little area there. Bursts of 12 to 30 seconds. The way this works is, the reason I want you to understand is how much aerobic preparation do we need to do and how much anaerobic preparation do we need to do? Meaning, how many minutes of jogging do we need to do versus how many seconds of sprinting do we need to do? Again, it varies from team to team, from group to group, depending on what your talents are. But in order to, <clears throat> in order to be extremely efficient with fast, fast glycolysis, meaning I want Jimmy, Jimmy's our fastest kid, he's explosive, no one in the league can keep up with him. I want him to be able to repeat those efforts over and over and over again throughout the duration of a game and possibly in overtime. So for him to be able to do that early in the off season, we need to maximize his base of aerobic conditioning in the beginning. When that aerobic conditioning base is ex expanded wide, <clears throat> then we have a higher ceiling height on what his potential is for repeating those fast explosive efforts later on down the season. I can't express enough how important it is early in the off season to establish an aerobic base. And every kid that reads a little bit is going to tell you, well, coach can play lacrosse, I don't need to run a mile, I don't need to run two miles. I mean, it's the last thing that he wants to do. But early in the summer, <clears throat> before our league starts, it's a very important time to address some of those things. Once we get into this time of year, we're doing very few repetitions of long distance. Just about everything we're doing, or actually nothing that we do, is over 36 seconds right now at this particular time. So everything is much shorter, but it's very high intensity. It's all top end speed kind of work. So I just wanted to give you a, a brief synopsis of that. So I spend, when you talk about the year as a whole, we spend about 70% of our time on anaerobic or sprint work, a short, short burst, high intensity sprint work, agility training, resistive running, things like that. And about 30% of our year is on our aerobic base. Um, if you looked in a more short, short, in a shorter version of our year, could say uh, in the middle of our season in February and March, it would be about 95% anaerobic and maybe a little sprinkle of some endurance work in there depending on the week. Um, conditioning duration and frequency often depends on the practice duration and frequency. Some programs practice six days a week, anywhere from an hour and a half to three hours a night. You may not need as much supplemental conditioning as you think. And vice versa. 
One thing to take a, a very stiff look at, though, is what is your practice makeup like? Are your practices high speed? Are they quick transition from one drill to the next? Is there much downtime? How many kids are standing around during a drill? Look at those types of things because that will either condition or decondition your team whenever you're going through those practices, especially if you're not doing any supplemental uh, conditioning on the side. 32. Dang. All right, so um, I try to get through that as fast as I can. Again, this is a topic, this could be a week-long seminar on, on how, to, how to develop young kids. So uh, a couple minutes here, fire away, you can throw some questions, and I'll, I'll help out as much as I can. Take a sip of coffee while you think about it. Right, 32 minutes and 42 seconds. Boom. Yes. Yes. So, um, glycolysis uh, or fast glycolysis is basically <clears throat> it's basically anything from um, from 12 seconds to about 30 seconds, depending on what research you read. And so we use repeat sprints, any kind of interval sprinting work. Um, obviously, the more specific you get, I want our, if I'm getting really specific, I want our kids in their cleats, in their gear, flak jackets on, helmets on, mouthpiece in their mouth, gloves on. <clears throat> that would be the most specific. And then you can also dummy that down. You can start to strip the gear off, and then you can even get down to where you're changing the surface. You can have them run the grass, you can have them run on the track, and change things up that way. So in the off season, we start out a little simpler with track work and things like that, where I get them away from that surface a little bit. Um, it's a little, the, the, the nice thing about turf is it's very forgiving on knees and joints and things like that. The thing that kind of sucks about it is that um, it takes away from your ability to react a little bit. It gives when you push on it, so it can actually slow you down when you're changing direction. <clears throat> Whereas the old school Astro turf and things like that, when you push on it, it gives a direct return. You can see guys be a little bit quicker in terms of surfaces like that. Changing the surface up can, can, can change up the intensity. And, and, the, and then also, uh, we're fortunate we have a sand pit, so we can do some work in the sand pit as well. And that adds another level of intensity. It, it actually provides a little bit of resistance because you're burying your foot down in the sand and having to recover and get into the next drive. So a really simple version, we use a series of gassers often. For me, a full gasser, the width of the field, and usually our practice field is a is an indoor football field. It's about 55 yards long, give or take a couple of feet. <clears throat> Over and back, twice, two round trip, what we call a full gasser. Um, a full gasser standard time for our team is 36 seconds. And so 36 seconds is enough to challenge our fastest guys. Most of them can make that no problem. But it's kind of in the middle to where some of our slower guys, it's challenging, they can make it, but it's, it's a little tough on them. And then we can play with those times a little bit. So if I got big tons of midfielders that can run them in 32 seconds, then I may cut their time down a little bit compared to, say, a goalkeeper that's struggling with 36. A half gasser would be over back in 16 seconds. And then a quarter gasser straight across in seven seconds. Um, <clears throat> when we run these things, there's two things I manipulate. The time, so I can manipulate, you know, if it's early in the off season, we're doing quarters, I may give them nine seconds. We start out nice and easy, build them into it. So I can adjust the time, the goal times we're running on them, and then I can also adjust the rest periods, which I'm a bigger fan of. I like to try to keep the times as standard as I can, but then we start out in the early off season, I'll start out around a three to one rest to work ratio when we're running. So if it takes us, <clears throat> excuse me, if it takes us uh, 15 seconds to run a drill, then we get 45 seconds of break because we have three to one. Um, eventually getting to our most sport specific will be a one-to-one -one work to rest ratio or even for some guys less than that um, <clears throat> and so you can manipulate those rest periods and those goal times uh, especially when you have a sprint drill like a gasser um, and it's very standard the distance is standardized you can adjust those rest periods and those goal times to fit your team and to fit your time of year um, and then you can progress them as well. Your team starts to crush the times that you originally started them on six weeks earlier, and you can start to progress those times and progress those intensities. Um, and if you'll email me, we have endless, I mean, we have all kinds of different durations. Uh, we have different activities where they're chasing each other, more competitive drills and things like that. So um, another topic I can probably talk a couple, couple days on, but great question. 
Anything else? Uh, my email address is up there on the front, so if you guys ever do have questions, fire me emails. I answer them as fast as I can. Um, I can provide you with slides. I can provide you with videos. Uh, we'll help out our, our lacrosse community as much as possible. So thanks for giving me your ear, and uh, good luck this season.